everyone, this is Stephen Weintraub with Collider, and I am here at our studio at the Cinema Center at Marvel. And uh, I think I said Marvel wrong. Did you say at Marvel? Is this already becoming about no, Deadpool? No, it, it is not becoming about okay, Deadpool, okay, I promise you. I don't want to get um, in trouble. That'll, I have so many responses to that. But anyway, I'm just going to say we are here for all the light we cannot see. I see Netflix being like, you are not here promoting something else. Yeah, but we're definitely <laughs> using this stuff. Do not cut it out. Right. Um, I really want to start with a sincere, and I really mean this. Congratulations on this project. Um, I thought you did such a great job with this. Um, and I'm sure you're feeling relieved that he didn't F it up. You know, it's being, I'm just being completely I'm honest. I'm thrilled. Sean you know? did an incredible job. But how nervous were you initially? Are you, can I just take over the interview? Uh, absolutely. When you heard, because I know they had tried to develop it as a movie, and then you heard that the guy was who had I had done some Night in the Museum movies and we had produced Arrival and Stranger Things. How'd you feel at first? You're like, how in, in what world does that make sense? Or... At first, I was thrilled. I was so excited because the original plan when we sold the film rights was for like a hundred minute sure. feature. So to be able to expand the material and our first phone call that Sean was really emphasizing, this can be four hours. The novel's 500 pages. So to be able to turn it into something four, even we were talking about six, maybe mm -hmm. something with a lot more space to explore the characters and the settings. You know, I was thrilled. So I was really excited. However, yeah, when they did send me the link to watch the, the episodes, I think my password is like like very, very nervous seven or something like that. So I was a little nervous. I did not know that. But I was thrilled. I will say that, um, and I say this with all sincerity, if this had been a two hour movie, it would have sucked. Like straight up. Like this, this, there's too much material in this. And the advantage of streaming and Netflix to be able to do this is it gave the project enough money and time to be able to tell this story. But Sean, I, I definitely have a specific question for you. This is so out of your wheelhouse, so not anything that you've done before. Um, talk a little bit about, was there hesitation to take on a project that was so different or was there just tons of excitement to show that you could do something like this? Yeah, well, I feel like, I mean, you and I have known each other since Real Steel, I think. And, uh, and so, you know, all my movies and shows, whether they're action or comedy, I'm always trying to co-opt a small part of its DNA for heart and for emotion. And, uh, and, but you have to be judicious in how you do that in a movie like Free Guy or Adam Project. But always coming up as a film student, as an, a, a younger director, I wanted to make all kinds of stuff. And so for me, like my idols are people like Peter Weir, people like Spielberg, people who are not limited to genre and who get the privilege of working in a bunch of them. And so uh, I read this book when it first came out. I wanted it so badly. The rights were gone. They were developing it as a movie. And and I felt like, oh, I feel like I know how to do this. And, and I will say, maybe I was apprehensive on one level, but I just I had this gut feeling that I knew these characters. I connected with these themes. And the truth is that being able to tell a story where you don't have to service the joke, you don't have to service the action set piece, you're just servicing character and writing, and you're bringing that world to life, that was liberating and really, really gratifying to me. I would say it was Sean's wheelhouse, young actors, Lots of heart, lots of humanity. Of course, maybe the sets, the 1938 cars and stuff were new for him. But I, what, what it was so encouraging to me when he first contacted me about the project was this is somebody who knows how to tell story about curious kids with a lot of heart who want the best for each other. But circumstances are making things difficult. for them. Uh, That is I've never linked this to my body of work in that way. And uh, so now thank you. I'm a little troublingly self-aware now, uh, but thanks for making that connection. Uh, so this is you, you, you essentially made a four hour movie that's in four parts. Um, and I know that uh, cause I spoke to you, we were talking when you were shooting, uh, what point of the shoot were you like, what the F have I signed on for? Well, it was, I mean, we filmed in Budapest. It was a long shoot. It was 80 something days. I'm dealing with hundreds of extras and military sequences and war scenes. And COVID. Oh, and yes. Well, and COVID and being on the other side of the world and eight hours ahead of my family, my company, 21 Laps, and all my friends. Um, so it, on the one hand, it felt daunting. But I will say that every day I had some sense of, oh, this is going to be worth it. 
this is going to be worth it. And when I first put the show together, there have been many moments in the edit room, on the mix stage, at the scoring stage with James Newton Howard, where I've sat back and I've said very kind of consciously to myself, oh, this was worth it. This is why I went through all that, because I got to make something lyrical and epic and hopefully audiences will agree moving in a way that was new to me, but which I'd always aspire to. I definitely want to talk about your lead. Um, and I, I really also want to give credit to Netflix for letting you cast a complete unknown. Um, but talk a little bit about uh, the casting process and because she's so good. And I, I don't want to pronounce her name wrong, which yeah, is why uh, Aria I, Mia Liberti. Um, and yeah. and uh, in fact, we have two girls who play Marie, the lead. The lead character in Tony's book is uh, Marie Lore, who's a blind French girl. And I needed uh, an eight-year-old and I needed a 20-year-old. And we did an open casting call. And thanks to Netflix, which is this globally ubiquitous company, we put out, we just put out kind of like a flyer online. Anyone could send in an audition sighted actors, unsighted actors, low vision, non-actors. And I got this audition from a non-actor and her name was Aria and she is a Fulbright scholar, PhD student in rhetoric. This is not only her first part, it was her first audition. And when I saw this audition, I knew there might be something special there. And with every Zoom, with every callback, that gut feeling was confirmed. And uh, you've seen the show. It was, it's a really masterful performance. But again, this was someone who came to acting having never done it. So imagine any of us here learning how to do our job while doing that job in front of 300 people. She it, came to acting being told she wasn't able to act as a young girl, too. So she really yeah, that dream was discouraged. She to was told it. she has memories of being a, a kid and being told by theater teachers and others, that's not for you. That's not going to be your path. And so it's just kind of miraculous. She leapt out. Like a thousand, I think Sean said, numbing quantity of auditions. She leapt out. She put on her grandmother's clothes. So she was wearing period clothing. And she just screamed Marie when you I should also her. add, Steve, it's not just that she came to this saying, I don't know how to do this, but I want to be great. Tell me how to be great. I'm going to work to be great. So tell me how to do that. And I did. And she could handle, in fact, she wanted candor which not all actors do, right? She wanted to know how to be great at this new endeavor. But she also every day helped me because the script might say, oh, Marie, you know, feels for the couch and sits down. But Ari would say, well, how long have I lived in this room? Because if I've lived here for a year and I live alone and no one moves furniture, I don't need to feel for that couch. I know where it's going to be because I've mapped the space that I'm intimate with. So things like that, right, that are are flouting the tropes and cliches of how we see this disability represented. A hundred years of movies where a blind person has not played the blind character. And so when you get two blind girls playing this blind character, I become as much the student as the leader. What shines through in her performance is not her disability, but her capabilities. And I, she's such a capable character. So I, I was really moved by her performance. Oh, no, 100%. And by the way, if her performance doesn't work, the whole thing falls apart. Yep. I mean, this thing does not work. So one of the things is that, and, and I'm curious for, for both of you. So obviously, when we see Nazis depicted in movies, and basically they're always evil because they're fucking evil, you know, but you have a... A, I guess it right is you do have a sympathetic character that is a Nazi, and and it made me realize maybe in a, in a way that you know not everyone was gung ho and they were still pulled in. Well, that was probably some of what you were scratching at when you wrote this character, right? Absolutely. I mean, we live at this time of polarity where you're just supposed to make a snap judgment about everybody, but history, life is so much more complex than that. Hitler Youth is sweeping kids when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. At the end of the war, they're sending 14-year-olds off to battle. So, of course, he's being indoctrinated by a new technology, uh, radio that's come into the world and is uh, able to spread disinformation in a way that humans were not able to do that at a time. So, I hope even as you recognize he's making morally wrong decisions, you understand how Werner got to that situation in his life. Look, being honest, and so we should say that the, you should give a little bit more background on the character for people who haven't seen or read the book um, or or seen the trailer. But um, 
Uh, well, let's start with that. Maybe you should. I, I mean, I'll, I'll take a whack at that. It. Um, so one of the two leads is a character named Werner, who is a German orphan who shows this early, almost prodigy level skill with radios. Um, and he is uh, taken from his orphanage and put into one of these Nazi training schools that were historically very real and and would often indoctrinate the youth of Germany into this into this military but into this ideology. Werner's a character who is not indoctrinated into that ideology, who has a love for technology, has a talent for this emerging technology, but who is actually committed to keeping his soul clean who has a sister who literally says to him when he's taken away, do not let them convince you. Do not let them change you. Keep the frequency in sure. your head the same. You mean 1310. Go on. Yes, I do mean <laughs> frequency 1310. Sorry, it's an inside joke. Inside people, joke. Well, you really well, should see it. You yeah, really should Eventually just watch you're going to see it and then you'll understand that. But anyway, that, to, to Tony's point, that was the point is that Certainly, the Nazis are some of the most cruel, evil people we've seen in human history. But that doesn't tell the full story of every individual. And Werner is a fictional individual, but one who reminds us that the nuance of what a person is, is not fully described by the uniform they're put in. Also, we should point out there are some very evil Nazis in the movie. So, you know. Oh, yeah. This, this there, is hardly a, 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 an apologist uh, work. Yeah. You know, I am, you know, as a Canadian Jew back here in Canada, um, there was a choice. Obviously, the book is not a Holocaust story, but it is a World War II story. And the reality of what the Germans did in that time is abhorrent and appalling. And the fact that we're even talking about or hearing about a resurgence of that ideology uh, is fucking grotesque. So um, so definitely our show is committed to showing the grotesquerie of that mindset, um, but it's also really kind of zooming in on this one character and, and this one girl and this one boy and how their destinies intersect. Talk a little bit about uh, the fact that you were filming very close to uh, the Ukraine border uh, and that war was going on and, you know, what it meant filming so close. Steve, get this. So we're in the neighboring country to Ukraine. We're filming scenes of the exodus of refugees out of Paris when the Germans invaded. Some of the extras playing refugees marching west were Ukrainian refugees who had marched west into Hungary, where we were filming. So that was a mirroring of real life that was heartbreaking um, and kind of just took our breath away on those days. I'm curious, and you know, I'm, this is a question I've asked you a thousand times and I will ask it again. Um, you know that, and, and the editing process is ultimately where this whole thing comes together. So what did you learn from friends and family screenings or test screenings that impacted the, the, the final four episodes in ways you didn't expect? Really good question. Um, let's see. I learned that it's hard to feel for a character. I re I'd read the book, right? And I'd read the scripts. So we would have certain scenes, particularly with Hugh Laurie's character, Etienne, um, who is a damaged character. He's traumatized from the First World War and he lives agoraphobically in his house. Initially, there was a structure to one of the episodes where we were asking the audience to feel for that character before they had connected with that character. So we did a fairly radical restructure on episode four in particular in order to vest the audience with Hugh Laurie's character before we're asking the audience to feel for him. And so that was a big revelation. That was, I've never done this where I watched the first cut that was assembled per the script and I felt instantly, why am I not feeling it? Why am I not feeling it? And so I sat there and I hand wrote every scene of the show on an index card and I put them out on the floor and then I started moving things around. And then I said to my editor, okay, do this version. Let me see this version. And so we literally restructured episode four in an attempt to fully engage the audience and 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 to have them feel the stakes of the characters before you see any outcomes of characters. Yeah, um, it's so editing is so amazing. Like, People don't no even realize, man. I mean, performances are constructed. 
in the edit room performances are and can be destroyed in the edit room. I will say this about actors, though. I love actors. I think that's clear from the way I cast all my movies. And so if an actor's given me the good shit, I'll let that take run long because those are the moments where they're not talking or it's not a scripted behavior where it feels like, oh man, there's something really authentic happening here and I just want to live with it. And when it's done well, um, and when you allow the audience to kind of have those moments where it's a little messier, a little more surprising, uh, those are my favorite ones. I am curious when you finally, so you, you get the link or however you're going to watch it, right? What is it like First of all, did you actually have any notes or anything that you saw and were like, we really should do this? Uh, well, of course, you know, you're seeing scripts all along. So I had plenty of notes as we're getting there. Uh, I know that it was a final cut when I got to see it, but there was one Chiron. You know what those are? This little date thing at the bottom that was wrong. I'm like, I think I can tell Sean about this. Yeah, but uh, you're making it sound. I mean, the truth is that in script, especially. And that's when I was most nervous um, because we ch it's an adaptation, right? There's things that are in the book that aren't in the show. There's things that Stephen Knight invented that are not in the book. Um, I, I didn't tell the full ending from the book. Um, so there were changes. And, and Tony, I have to say, he had a fair number of notes in script form, many of which Steve and I applied in the rewrites. Um, but he also came to this understanding that this is a different medium and it's never going to be 100 percent faithful. It's so uh, liberating to be reminded that if I want to blow up a building, it's free. I just use language, right? These really inexpensive materials. Everything that Sean decides costs money. So, you know, he has to make an infinity of decisions that as a novelist, I'm just totally free to make. But I was also quite jealous of the collaborative nature of his job. Every decision has to be made by me. When he's talking about ways that Arya brought new things to the character that weren't in the script or that we couldn't foresee as sighted people... That's that's a kind of gift of collaborative work. So I was really moved to see him work like a general with this vast army of people. Keep everybody quiet. Everybody's in mass. There's like this epic heat wave, like roasting Europe. And he's got everybody positive late into the afternoon on the set. I just was so moved by his leadership skills on, on the whole set in Budapest. Well, I always say like, because I've spoken to a lot of authors and about adaptations, and the truth is the book is always there. It's not like the book has gone away. It's just this is the version that, you know what I mean? Yeah, this but is I, a different thing. This is a totally different medium. And the best uh, path to success is to let Sean make the thing he wants to make. Whether or not it's faithful to, in every single detail to the book doesn't matter nearly as much as in terms of the heart, the beating heart of it. Do you care about these people? And do you feel for these kids when the circumstances of history are compressed? Pressing them into these boxes that they really don't want to be in. I'm curious with uh, because obviously with Netflix, uh, you want to end things on cliffhangers. So because obviously it makes people want to click play on the next episode. I, for example, episode uh, one ends on a cliffhanger. Episode two has stuff like so. How did was that in the script phase? Was that um was, is that like a note that Netflix gives or you sort of know because you've worked with them the, so for so you're long? You're talking to the producer of Stranger Things, yeah, right? So like the Duffers, one of their North Star principles is stick the landing, always stick the landing, but have people leaning in for what is coming next. And so I, I credit to Stephen Knight, all four episodes, all three rather episodes were built with a cliffhanger ending, but the way that my editor and I edited those final 60 seconds of every episode, for one thing, I know that has to be, that has to be maximum captivating. And, and, and I mean, there, there's a bunch of things that I see are Stranger Things inspired in this show, even though they seem like they have nothing in common. But some of the metrics to the editing, some of the heightened sound work that we do on Stranger Things, we absolutely do in this. But definitely the way that we try to stick the landing, but invite that play next, play next. Um, I guess after eight years of Stranger Things, that's baked into my sensibility and I wanted it for this too. My son got to visit the set and he was his first year of college. So we got to see the show, I think maybe in mid-April when he got home from college. I'm like, oh, and you're going to get to see the show that we helped make, that we were there for. And he could not stop himself fast enough between one and two and two and three and three and four. I'm like, don't you want to eat or go to the bathroom or something? But he was just like, here we go. I oh. need the next one. Oh, no, I'm letting everyone know episode, end, episode one ends on a cliffhanger and episode 
I mean, you're going to keep pushing play. One, two, and three are all cliffhangers. There's no secret there. And um, I'm showing my hand. But again, it's like sometimes you can know the magic trick. But if it works, you still love the magic trick. Listen, it's a four part series. Like we, anyway, um, so I am curious. Uh, you've obviously have a long relationship with Netflix and uh, it's commend like the book was super popular. But talk a little bit about was it tough to get them to say we want to make this? And was it tough? You know what I mean? Like yeah. or do they sort of because of your success with them? They're sort of like we're in the Sean business there. I Certainly, they say yes more readily because they're in the Sean business. And I've tried to earn that faith by rewarding them on the bets they make on me. And, you know, whether it's been Shadow and Bone or Stranger Things or Unsolved Mysteries or All Light We Cannot See or Adam Project, we, we've had a good run. We're having a good run. Um, but I would just say that... Uh, you know, Ted and, and, and Bella Bajaria, they were really blunt. They're like, look, we're backing you. You want to do this with unknown, low vision or blind girls playing lead? Okay. Um, we're going to give you enough money to do it right. I will tell you that the budget was not nearly as stratospheric as a lot of the budgets we hear on other limiteds, both at Netflix and at other uh, networks and platforms. Uh, I pride myself on being efficient and pragmatic as a producer. But yeah, I guess they're willing to bet on me. This was such a big title that it becomes its own form of IP. But they acquired the book. We got Stephen Knight, who is as good a screenwriter as you can get. But then the big bet was, oh, wait, you're going to cast people that no one's ever heard of to play the two leads, the boy and the girl. Um, to which I said, yes, thank you. But I don't want to give any money back. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to go find some famous people to play these two adult males. Sure. And um, thankfully, I delivered with Ruffalo and Hugh Laurie. I'm just about out of time with you, and I'm going to apologize to you right now. But um, we have a long-standing interview history. A repartee, you might say. Where, where towards the end, I might ask him about some other projects. I've been prepared. And so I just wanted to, so I'm going to quickly, yeah. quick updates. Um, I'm assuming nothing has happened with Star Wars. We were just starting the process of developing my movie and a writer strike happened. So we are we are in that holding pattern that so much of our industry is in. Real Steel TV series. Uh, same. I could literally say see above, see above. Sure. Um, same. Still, I, I, as I've told you, I want it as badly as the lovers of Real Steel want it. So alive paused do you think a free guy sequel actually happens or is it sort of like this was so good and came out so great do we want to make another i think it is definitely not uh assured we love free guy and the love for free guy that has kind of resonated in like after shocks if you will in the last couple of years that's been thrilling to ryan and i we are developing a sequel um but the truth is that you now have Barbie that has obviously left a mark about a character in a fictional world who comes to self-awareness. So we're only going to make Free Guy 2 if it's different than the first movie and if it's different from other movies. I'm a fan of Shadow and Bone. I don't know what's the status of season three. Neither do I yet. OK, I'll leave it there. Yeah. So you were filming. How many days had you actually been filming before you got shut down on Deadpool? Thirty five days. Oh, so you were really into it. No, we're it. in it. Like we, we, we were exactly halfway through filming Deadpool and then we stopped. Can I ask you, was there any consideration in the filming in your first 35 days, knowing that the strike might happen where you wanted to shoot scenes that had VFX so you could get those done? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course I do. That would have been smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been so savvy, but I guess maybe like others in our industry, I somehow thought this strike, this second strike would be averted. Uh, and then suddenly it was upon us and I had to send several hundred people home and, uh, and they're still waiting to come back to work. So I'm just really, I'm, I don't use this word lightly, but I am yearning for a resolution that feels fair and equitable and gets this industry back to work. I know I have to wrap with you, but I'm going to do one follow up on Deadpool uh, because people don't know much about it. Can you tease anything about the, the movie in terms of what it's about? I'll just say that it very much leans into the fact that this one is Deadpool and Wolverine. This one is much more of a two hander than either Deadpool movie has been. It's still, as I've told you, raw, audacious. R-rated. Very much so. Love uh, it. But you have two major movie stars 
together in a movie playing their most iconic signature roles, that is director heaven. And so the story, the tone, the movie itself leans into that gift of having Deadpool and Wolverine co-starring in a movie for the first time. So uh, we're, we're definitely not running away from that. Uh, my last question for you. Um, I know that you always direct episodes of Stranger Things. When the strike ends, they're obviously going to start filming Stranger Things and you're going to be working on Deadpool. Do you think you're actually going to direct any of the yes. final season? Like for sure. I bleed for that show. I've been alongside Matt and Ross Duffer for all these years. I direct episodes every year. It's a part of our brotherhood. It's a part of my commitment and my love of the show, connecting with it as a director as well as an executive producer. So I will go through hoops to figure out calendars to direct at least one episode. I was going to say it's normally episode three or four, but I don't know if it'll be. Th that's the part that's up in the air. I really mean a, a sincere congratulations on all the light. It is so well done. I know audiences are going to love it. Uh, congratulations on everything. And um, and Sean knows I wouldn't actually say that. If that's I... very true. He can be a mean little bastard. No, see, that's not that's actually not. No, that's not true. But his enthusiasm is never faked. No, I, I don't fake it. Like yep. I really have to like it to yeah. say so something like you. that on camera. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Do we so call much, you Frosty Steve. anymore? Or is it always Steve? It, it, it doesn't yeah. matter. You for can, those of us who've known you for yeah, a while. It's a whole thing. Yeah, anyway, listen, everyone Frosty. is watching. Tune into All the Light. It's going to be on Netflix in early November. November 2nd. And um, I really appreciate you guys coming in, and I wish you nothing but the best. Thank, Thank you. you.